So firstly, I should say uh, what a pleasure uh, it is uh, to be here. Um, I uh, am delighted to learn that we have an experienced audience that already has uh, a very developed understanding and expertise in competition law. Uh, it means that I can move swiftly through some uh, of the slides, which you will already be well familiar with. And I'll try to focus uh, on my own experience as a competition trial law lawyer uh, in the UK. Um, I've been involved there in a number of damages claims for breach of the competition rules, uh, both um, for claimants and for defendants. Uh, one of the advantages of being an independent barrister is that uh, you have the opportunity to work for both claimants and defendants, whereas law firms very often get a reputation for being either a defence practice or a claim practice, at least in uh, London, uh, whereas uh, barristers are supposed to take whatever case comes along, at least uh, as long as the client is able to pay the fees, an important qualification. Um, so uh, I'm also uh, very keen to make sure that what I say today is as useful as possible uh, to you uh, and to learn something of the Romanian experience. So if there are questions or observations which you would like to make as the speech is continuing, please don't hesitate uh, to interrupt me. Hecklers are, are very welcome, or alternatively we can pick up points uh, at the conclusion. Uh, my topic today uh, for the first section uh, is the disclosure of evidence with particular consideration of the treatment of am amnesty and leniency uh, applications. Uh, I should say that in my experience, disclosure is perhaps the most important aspect of a successful damages claim. Um, now, it is important, firstly, on a substantive level, in order to provide you, as either a claimant or defendant, with the information and evidence you need, which is held by the other side, which is crucial in order to prove your case and or to test the case which is being put against you uh, in written submissions and in evidence. Competition authorities have the great advantage that they can turn up unannounced at 8 o'clock in the morning. And I know that you have a very dynamic competition authority here in Romania in order to obtain the relevant evidence of wrongdoing. Uh, by those who are involved in anti-competitive conduct. Private parties, in the context of a damages claim, do not have that prerogative. So they are dependent upon the rules governing disclosure in the ordinary courts in order to obtain the material they need. And that raises interesting questions about how far they may use materials which have been collected by competition authorities. And there is a balance to be struck there as we will come on to discuss. So that is one reason why disclosure is extremely important. It is crucial at a substantive level, both to proving a case and to testing the other side's case. And that covers liability insofar as that is an issue, insofar as the, the claimant is not dependent exclusively, not relying exclusively on a prior decision of a competition authority, but it also covers loss. And of course, the figures, the papers, the accounting information, which is important for understanding loss, is all in the hands of the claimants. Uh, and uh, a defendant will need disclosure from the claimant, just as a claimant will need disclosure from a defendant. Um, but as well as the substantive dimension, in my experience of claims in the UK, Disclosure is also of key tactical or strategic importance. So the majority of the claims which are brought in the UK are follow-on damages claims. That's to say they are claims based upon a prior decision of a competition authority. 
uh, usually either the European Commission or our UK authority, the Competition and Markets or Authority. And in the context of those cases, there is an expectation that at the end of the day, the cartelists will end up paying some money. Courts are reluctant to allow cartelists uh, to escape without paying anything to those that made purchases from them. Uh, and they will therefore tend, as a practical matter, to err in favour of the claimant insofar as there is doubt about the extent of the loss. So that means that a lot of the litigation is actually not about the final trial and, and not about uh, damages awarded by the court, but about the prior process, the interim stages, and the level of difficulty and cost which those stages represent for both claimant and defendant. And re in reality, when people make applications for disclosure at the initial stages of the trial, they are actually trying to make life as terribly, terribly difficult and expensive for the other side as they possibly can. So that uh, defendants uh, will be uh, seeking to put claimants to a great deal of cost and effort. They will know that very often claims are brought by um, uh, for specialist litigation firms that have arranged funding on behalf of the claimant. Uh, they will have gone to the claimant's business and they will have said, we can offer you money for nothing. You, know, you, you, have been, you didn't realise it, but you have been the victim of a cartel. Uh, you must have suffered loss. Uh, and uh, with no effort for you, uh, if you just sign on the dotted line, we can obtain damages for you and in the process charge a very healthy fee. So that is how claimant firms uh, approach this. I, I caricature slightly and I exaggerate slightly. But the result of that is that often the claimant has very, the real claimant, the, the claimant, who, um, the, the, the company which has made the purchases, has very little interest in the claim. They just think and hope that they will one day receive a large sum of money at the end of the process. They do not want their time and effort so up in the process of finding documents. And so if there is an order against them to go and produce very large quantities of documents, often commercially sensitive documents, that will make them more likely to settle sooner for less money. Equally, if the, if the claimants can obtain an order for disclosure against the defendants, which is very extensive, uh, and which may disclose further and additional wrongdoing besides that which has already been the subject of a competition authority decision, uh, they uh, will uh, do so. They will put pressure on the defendants by obtaining such an order, and the defendants will then be inclined, even if the claim looks weak, to think about settling it in order to remove the nuisance and the cost which is associated with pursuing the claim. So at both a substantive level and at a tactical level, disclosure is of central importance in damages litigation. Now, uh, I'll now turn to consider the detail of the damages directive and the rules which that puts in place. I should say initially that my experience of litigating cartel damages claims has not been under the damages directive itself. And the reason for that is that it's a recent piece of legislation. But moreover, the implementation in the UK applies the directive only to conduct after the date when the damages directive was introduced. So the consequence of that is that it will be years before the damages directive has any practical impact on litigation in my country. Uh, and the reason for that long delay is in order to avoid any allegation of retroactive effect 
So that insofar as the rules in the damages directive affect the calculation of damages, for example, with the determination of loss, uh, it cannot be said that the party that is being subjected to the uh, claim, the defendant party, is being uh, judged by rules which are more onerous than those which applied when they committed their infringing conduct. So that's an important detail. But nonetheless, I, I hope that my experience uh, will, will be of some relevance in setting some of the uh, rules which emerge from the damages directive uh, in their proper context. So three sections to the presentation. I'll begin with the context and aims of the directive. I'll then turn to the general requirements in connection with disclosure. And finally, I'll consider how this balance is struck uh, with um, uh, public enforcement, uh, the specific rules regarding evidence included in the file of a competition authority. So to begin with the context and aims of the damages directive. Now, this is, is perhaps a bit basic for this audience, but there are, of course, two, as we all know, two potential methods of enforcing competition law. The public enforcement route via competition authorities with strong powers of investigation on the one hand, and on the other hand, the possibility of private claims uh, being brought in the ordinary courts. And those claims could be brought, brought on a standalone basis, where you prove not only loss, but also liability, that there has been an infringement in the first place. Or, uh, perhaps more realistically, uh, follow-on claims, where you rely on a finding of infringement which has already been made by the competition authority, relying on its powers of investigation, and you seek damages for the loss which has been suffered in consequence. In the UK, we have seen quite often a hybrid of these two, where the core of the case is an infringement decision, but you then add on, as the claimant, certain additional matters uh, in order to increase the risk uh, for the, um, uh, the defendant. Uh, and relying on the solid ma material, you build out with disclosure claims in the hope of establishing a case in relation to other more nebulous infringements. And there is even an extent to which competition authorities in the UK have uh, begun trailing aspects of their investigation in the final decision, which they do not pursue to a decision. So they will describe behavior, two plus two, if you like. They will give the clues, they will put down the crumbs, which could lead a claimant to um, uh, those aspects of the case which they don't feel confident